Hi everybody, this is Sylvain, your host. Thank you for joining Wine Geometry TV. This is episode 103. This week's topic is the wine language. I'm sure most of you feel impressed when some guy at a dinner table starts calling wines silky, smooth, bold, uh, giving hints of licorice or bell pepper. You're thinking, wow, I don't know what that means, but that guy is awesome. So eventually you let the specialist talk his way through with all the aromas of the wine until you actually understand that maybe you're feeling some of the similar things. The truth is you also feel something when you're tasting wine. It's just that you don't really know what it is. You can't put names on it. So one, your palate hasn't tried enough wines to detect those little hints and two, You've never learned uh, that a wine can be chalky or leathery and uh, most likely you're just going to call it uh, strong or fruity or uh, not tasty. But no worries, you're not any worse than uh, that show off that, uh, you know, was bragging about his uh, science. So now's the time for you to brag. There are two steps in bringing you to the next level. First. We need to have you trying more wines, obviously. And that's the purpose of my category, one week, one wine. That's why I'm tasting all these wines and I hope that you're following up the pace uh, with buying those wines from those recommended sites uh, that I'm giving you or from uh, the links that I'm giving on my page. So here is a picture of the wine aroma wheel. So what is that? Basically, it's something that's been designed by Dr. Ann Noble it categorizes the different aromas that you can find in wine, going from very simple aromas, so it's quite easy to understand that something's fruity, something spicy, or maybe woody. That, those are like, let's say, the basic sense that anyone uh, can, can sense. And then you're going more in detail into the composition so of the wine the middle afterwards. Of that circle, of that wheel, is the basic aromas, and then the more you get towards the edge of the circle is the more detailed aromas that you're going to feel. So my suggestion to you is that every time you taste the wine, from now on, you take a look at this aroma wheel, you look towards the center of it for the basic sense. Am I feeling caramel? Am I feeling, feeling fruits? Am I feeling spices or herbs? Once you've found that basic category, you go to the second circle to find more detail. For example, if it's fruity, do I feel berries? Do I feel tropical fruits? Do I feel citrus? And finally, when you've cut it down to its first subcategory, you should be able to find its detailed substance. Do you feel more red berries or blackberries? Do you feel more uh, tropical fruits, which are papaya or guava on your palate? Please note that there can obviously be more than one category for one wine. Some are spicy and fruity. Some are floral and nutty, for example. So you can go into details of both of those categories or more if there is. This is definitely a great tool to help you understand and memorize different wines. It's like if you wanted to remember me. You'd rather want to know me by my characteristics. I'm half American, half French. I'm a wine lover. I make videos about wine. Then just that saying that I'm Caucasian. In the first instance, you would be able to cut down the choices when talking about me to a friend, and you would be able to better determine who I am in a large group of people. Well, the, the same goes for wines. There are so many wines out there, it's almost impossible to remember them all. So you want to put them in categories. Categories of uh, geographical location, of course, uh, but also of type of wine used, so type of grape used, and then the taste observed. The other benefit of working this way is that you'll be able to compare wines. When enjoying wines from different countries, you're going to be able to see how New World wines from Australia, from New Zealand, from Chile, uh, or other, compare to Old World wines, France, Italy, and so on. Results can be radically different. Some grapes can be used in two different countries and have exactly the same taste or very different taste. That's what we want to reach. We want to reach an understanding 
of what we're drinking, of what we like, so that at the end of the day, you only drink what you like and you don't waste your time with those wines that are not worth it. And that way, you're going to put your money only into those wines that are good. So don't hesitate to practice your skills. Start learning, uh, start trying wines, that's the first thing. And then uh, when you're trying wines, get that wheel in front of you and start looking at the different hints that you can feel, that you can smell, that you can taste. That way, you're going to be able to be more educated. And actually, I think that you're just as good as anyone to become a Shakespeare of This wine. week, in our category, One Week, One Wine, we're continuing on Bordeaux wines, as this region has been the root of winemaking and vineyards for the past 300 years. It is certainly the most diverse wine region in the world, combining many grapes and soils, as I told you last time, and has inspired other countries in their wine development. And quite a fair number of Bordeaux winemakers have actually been globetrotting around the world to civilize the techniques of winemaking. So they've been uh, buying land in countries of the new world and showing them the techniques uh, to expand their own knowledge and uh, eventually uh, their wealth. So this week, we're going to try a wine called Chateau de Fiusat. It's a vintage 2003. It comes from Pessac Léognon. So Pessac Léognon, as I said last week, it's from the Grave region. So I'm putting back the picture, the map of last week, just so you can see where it is. So this wine, here you can have a look at it. This wine is located in the Grave region, and this chateau is now 400 years old. It has received the Grand Cru appellation for its region. So it is not a Grand Cru from 1855, from that older appellation, but in Grave, in that region, that sub region now, they have made a new Grand Cru appellation, and this wine belongs to it. The average age of the vines in this wine yard is 30 years, which means that the grapes are now mature. Remember that a vine uh, is pretty much good until 50 years. Uh, after that, you're probably going to want to change it. It's, the productivity of the, of the vine is not going to be so high. And 30 years is good because it has, been, it has had time to uh, develop uh, its roots correctly, has been able to take into the soil the water that it needs. The first years of the vines, the vines aren't going to be that good. That's why in the first years, where in the 80s and 90s, when uh, the Bordeaux winemakers were going to China, for example, and they were trying to make wine, the first years, they were not successful. The vines were too young. Okay, so it needs time. Now that it's 20, 30 years old, now it makes sense to drink Chinese wine. So, moreover, the winemakers in this chateau plant the vines closely packed to each other to force the vines to compete uh, for, nutri for nutrients and dig deeper into the soil for nutrition. This vineyard consists of 60% Cabernet Sauvignon, 33% Merlot, 4.5% of Cabernet Franc, and 2.5% of Petit Verdot. So we're looking at a structure that has the same uh, grapes as uh, the one we tried last week, the Chateau Be Begadane. But this week, it's an opposite structure because it's more Cabernet Sauvignon than Merlot. This means that we should be finding black currant taste with spicy notes, with maybe bell pepper hints, because that is a characteristic of a dominant of Cabernet Sauvignon. Due to an oak barrel treatment, we could have also some leather, some wood, and some vanilla hints. So, I always want to talk about a specialist when I'm talking about the wine so that you don't just hear about me. So this 2003 vintage was rated 90 points out of 100 by a wine spectator, one of the industry's main critics, one of the dominant critics. So 90 points is supposed to be still uh, very good to excellent wine. So let's see how it looks. But before I taste it for you, um, here, uh, here are a few tips and tricks. Do you know how to properly open a bottle of wine? I was thinking about the, the other day. Do you actually know how to open a bottle of wine properly? This is something that sounds and looks obvious to me, but actually I was thinking about it the other day and I thought I've never 
showed my YouTube uh, members actually how to open a bottle of wine. So I'm going to open it in front of you uh, today. So usually, to open a bottle of wine correctly in front of guests, you will have to take off the lid first, the top lid, with a knife, okay, or in my case, I have a part of the screw opener, the cork opener, sorry. So you will take the knife on the top lid here, okay, so you go around it like this, okay, so you take it off like that. And then the second step is to take either your classic uh, cork opener and you twist it, you know, and then you put it between your legs and you pop it open, right? Or you can use one like mine, okay? This is the one I showed you already last time. So you can find it on Lazada or Amazon or whatever. And this is how it goes. So you squeeze it on the top of the bottle and then it's a simple pull and push, okay? And then to take out the cork, it's again pull and push. Okay, and here you go. So let's try it out. This wine, I put it out of the of my cellar uh, about 45 minutes ago, so that it could start to get uh, to room temperature. Normally, I should actually have opened it uh, 30 minutes ago, so that it would actually breathe at room temperature. But for you, I wanted to open the bottle, so that's why uh, this week I changed things a bit. All right, so as usual, I'm always swirling the wine. First thing, when I get the wine into the glass, okay? So I wrote actually this week um, a little bit about the glass that you should have when you're drinking wine, when you're drinking red wine, white wine, champagne, okay? So when you're drinking a red wine, um, there's been studies uh, to explain that you need a large, a wide bowl, okay? A wide on the, on the bottom side so that the aromas can actually spread, it can diffuse but actually narrow towards the top so that it can concentrate the aromas to your nose, okay? So it should look like a tulip, actually, an ideal glass of wine. Should, so this, this glass is good. It has a nice bottom shape, but the top could be a little bit more narrow. All right, very dark colors. Uh, it's actually almost brownish. So this is typically the characteristics of more Cabernet Sauvignon, first of all, and second of all, a wine that's already aged, okay? So this wine is, what, 14 years old? So it's definitely time to drink it now. When you look at colors like this, uh, it's definitely time to drink it, and I think this is not going to last long um, if, I, if I leave it here. And if I drink it again tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, it's not going to be that good. So I'm definitely going to want to have some friends over to finish the bottle uh, today or tomorrow. Wow, this is a very powerful wine. Mm. And the smell is really um, clear. It has medium to high intensity aromas of uh, ripe black fruit, definitely black fruit, black currant. We're talking blackberry, we're talking fig, we're talking even some licorice. Okay, definitely licorice actually. It's very long in the mouth, so of course with the age it has taken leathery, oaky, woody notes. It's spicy. I love that about it, by the way. It's really good. It's still developing, actually, in my mouth. It's very long, very complex. Wow, it's a really uh, solid wine. Uh, a bit aggressive, slightly aggressive, so I wouldn't recommend it for the, for the beginner drinker but it's definitely a great wine in terms of depth and length. I would drink it now, I would not wait. It's a really an exceptional wine. Um, this wine actually uh, trades at $93 uh, a bottle, and if you go on this link, you're gonna find where to buy it, and you're gonna find a great discount. So don't miss it, please buy it now. So now it's time for the rating. This wine is an exceptional wine, no doubt about it. Uh, it has no default, it's well structured, it's a robust structure. Uh, the smell is quite nice. Uh, the depth is there, definitely, as I talked about 
all the different scents of blackberry, blackcurrant, fig, um, again, vanilla, oak, and leather are in there due to the uh, oak barrel treatment. It's definitely spicy. I love the mix of it. It's very deep and it's long as well. So I, you got that those 45 seconds to one minute in your palate developing really, really nice. Uh, the only slight criticism I would have is maybe uh, it's really the last years that you should drink it. Uh, it's slightly aggressive on the beginning uh, of the taste and that could make it a bit difficult for some of you uh, out there, some of you drinkers. So globally I would rate it at 17, 17 and a half out of my uh, 20 points of rating. So I definitely uh, don't go against those 90 points of uh, Wine Spectator. So now the question, what to pair it with? Music wise, I would definitely pair it with classical music. A Beethoven, a Mozart, something strong, a bit aggressive that uh, pairs with the robustness of this wine. Food wise, I would definitely pair it with a red meat or a cheese like a Comté, uh, Gruyère, okay, something like that. I wouldn't go too strong. I talked one day to a wine expert and food expert and who was telling me, I don't understand why everybody keeps tell saying that you need to put a strong red wine with a strong cheese. You're just going to cancel cheese. each other's taste, right? So it makes no sense. You'd rather use a strong wine with something that's medium, let's say light to medium uh, strong meat or cheese. So definitely a red meat like a beef, but not too strong. And I'd go for, as I said, a Comté. All right, guys, that's the wrap. That's all for today. Thank you for watching the show again. Uh, don't hesitate to keep drinking wines, to keep going on to those recommended wines that I'm giving you. It's really beneficial for you to go try wines and look at those uh, aromas on the aroma wheel. I really want to, you to get educated with that. And don't forget that a wine a week keeps your palate unique. Strong.